Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is part five of The Curse of Palmyra. If you haven't watched parts one through four, now's the time to push pause, check those out, and get back with us because we can't go back and do a recap because we're on part five after all. So first, let's do the copyright disclaimer. Additionally, this is the only video of the series that'll have, I believe, three explicit photos. And since there are three photos of the skull, I'm giving you the warning now that this is sensitive subject matter. And also, of course, not for children. Therefore, also, this is not gonna be a monetized video by me. What YouTube does is what YouTube does. And the final caveat is that Stephanie Stearns was found not guilty of the killing of Eleanor Muff Graham. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. It's July, 1979, and Wesley Buck Dwayne Walker escapes from McNeil Island Penitentiary after serving 42 months of a 10 year sentence. He was eventually sentenced down for passport violation and for interstate transportation of property because there were some appeals and some of his charges were overturned. So. He was out on the run when this next event occurs. It's November 1980. Sharon and Robert Jordan arrive on Palmyra. They're from Johannesburg, South Africa, and they sailed their boat, the Moya, to Palmyra. And they plan to stay there for several months. This is on the internet, so I'm giving credit to The Curse of Palmyra Island by Kurt Rowlett. He exchanged some emails with Sharon Jordan. She recalled, for me, Palmyra is the closest thing to paradise I have ever experienced. I felt as if I was part of the atoll during the roughly five months that we were there. I spent my days alone exploring different sections of the atoll. I would take a machete with me to open coconuts when I got hungry or thirsty. I swam and or snorkeled anywhere and everywhere. The sharks were numerous, but appeared well fed and were not threatening. I remember sitting on the beach of the inner lagoon and looking at the pristine beauty around me and wishing that this period would never come to an end. When initially investigating the atoll, Sharon found some clippings on a large table in the hut next to the seaplane ramp, and they just happened to be dealing with the Graham's disappearance, and so she perused them absolutely enthralled. The couple, they were interested in buried treasure and in salvage. Kurt Rowlett later asked her about these clippings and she said other yachties had obviously looked at them before us they were lying on a large table in this hut I didn't read them all just glanced through them in retrospect I wish that I had read them all and kept them I don't know what happened to them so it's January 4th 1981 and they're exploring a seaplane ramp on the south side of Cooper Island and they discover a sunken Air Force rescue boat in approximately 20 feet of water, and they manage to raise it. So it says here, they spotted a sunken Air Force rescue boat on the bottom of the lagoon and enthusiastically spent several days refloating it. But the boat was badly damaged and was missing two aluminum flotation chambers. So they let it sink once again, and Rob Jordan, that's Bob Robert Jordan, was content to lie in Moya's hammock and read paperback thrillers while Sharon wandered Palmyra's beaches looking for Japanese floats. Then on January 25th, she went beachcombing on Strawn Island and saw the gold glint of what was off a tooth of what later turned out to be a skull. Nearby was a box from an old military rescue boat. This article reads, nearby were other human bones, an aluminum box with its lid nearby and strands of wire presumably used to secure the lid. Later in court, they'll show that the wire that was wrapped around was in the exact shape of the box. And the skull and the box showed signs of fire. Sharon found the skull first, then she saw the aluminum box and she saw some bones falling out of the box in a crescent shape and a few remaining bones in the box. So the aluminum trunk was corroded and had an incomplete skeleton in it. Again, the aluminum box was found on its side and seemingly to the naked eye showed signs of fire. So it had char marks on both the bones and the box. 
along with the bones, a woman's wristwatch, and a cigarette lighter were also in the box. The Jordans rigged up a CB radio and signaled the Hawaiian Coast Guard. The Coast Guard then switched the directional antenna for emergency traffic to back to them, back to Palmyra, in order to make the call more clear. Of course, the FBI was notified, and Shishido, Calvin Shishido, who was aware of the missing grams from back in the day from Palmyra, gets the call, and he just immediately knows. So the agents, the authorities, make their way out to Palmyra. Of course, you can't just fly into it at that time. So they had to go to Christmas Island and then from Christmas Island take a vehicle to Palmyra. They gathered all the available evidence and took it back to the mainland for identification of the bones. And the dental records led to the positive identification of Mrs. Eleanor Muff Graham. William C. Irvin was the special agent in charge of the FBI's Honolulu office and he said, Sufficient remains were recovered and subjected to extensive examination by comparing past dental records, which led to the positive identification of Mrs. Graham. John Howard, assistant special agent in charge of the FBI, said that the skull, a jawbone, and other bones were found in the open metal container that it had washed onto a reef. He also noted that the bones appeared to be broken, so think dismemberment. Though Howard did not know if they were broken before or after the person died. We'll get to that later. They also had burn marks, he said, raising the possibility that someone had tried to destroy them. They wanted to determine if it's possible that the bones were all from one person, Muff, or if also some of these bones were Max bones. So they sent the remains off to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. Now think, this is before... DNA evidence was known to the scientific community. The, you know, a couple more years later that they're going to start doing that. But this is 1981 at this point. The remains were thoroughly examined and determined to be just the remains of Muff Graham. Also, it was plain to the naked eye, the skull of Mrs. Graham had a hole in the left temple, which is shown here. And this hole was thought to be a bullet hole. So you ask, where the heck was Mac Graham? Fierce protector of his spouse, where the heck was Mac? Well, the authorities looked around. They brought in divers. They couldn't, they couldn't find the body of Mac Graham. As the Jordans had discovered Mac's remains, Kurt Roulette asked Robert Jordan what his theory was as to Mac's body. And the answer was, I think he was undoubtedly dropped right off the dock, just as the container with Muff's body likely was. I made an attempt to find it a few years ago. The water in that location is up to 100 feet deep, and the visibility is really poor. The bottom is also densely strewn with military equipment in various stages of decay. It was evident on reaching the bottom that the search would need more equipment and staff than was available to me then. There is an area of about 100 yards by 50 yards that would probably turn it up, but at 100 feet in those poor conditions, it would be quite an expensive project with no financial potential. I'm fairly sure that area was where he dropped Muff's container. I know so well how the currents flow in that lagoon. The location where we found the container with Muff Graham's remains leaves little doubt in my mind as to where he dropped Mac Graham's body. So now the authorities proceeded to press the murder charges against the same defendants who had been convicted of stealing the sea wind. March 5th, 1981, Stephanie Stearns turned herself in at the federal building in LA with her attorney. Allegedly, there had been heat on her entire family to make her turn herself in, but that was just allegedly somebody, it's in one of these articles. And Buck Walker was still at large. On April 2nd, 1981, Stephanie Stearns, who at this point is age 34, pleads not guilty to murder and conspiracy. Her two attorneys, two L.A. attorneys at that time, were Leonard Weinglass of the Chicago 7 fame and his associate Brian J. O'Neill. 
And also, I believe she had Peter Wolf representing her. I think she had three attorneys at one point. So as a quote-unquote responsible citizen, she was free on $100,000 bail. Meanwhile, Buck was still on the loose as of April 2nd. The authorities are gearing up to start pressing forward with these cases. So on July 23rd, worried about pretrial publicity, Stephanie Stearns' attorneys asked for an order that her trial be moved to the mainland off of Hawaii because Hawaii was getting a lot of press coverage on this. By the time the Hawaiian authorities had gone looking for Buck, they found that he was on the lam from McNeil Island. See, he had been transferred to a minimum security p prison. That's McNeil Island in Washington State. I guess he'd been a good boy, so he got good behavior, and that's why he was able to be transferred there. And that old con had either walked or waded or swam across the Puget Sound of Freedom. So what was he doing while he was on the lam? This article gives a good backstory. 42 months after he entered prison, he escaped from the minimum security prison. According to the testimony of Noel Allen Ing Ingman, a former McNeil Island convict, Walker hooked up with Ingman and two other McNeil alumni to traffic marijuana from Mexico to the U.S. Walker lived much of the time in Oaxa, Mexico, trading guns for narcotics at a very beneficial rate, quote-unquote, according to Ingman. The enterprise lasted about two years, but collapsed when Ingman, who was then a heroin addict, went to the authorities. Ingman was given immunity from prosecution. He was given a new identity and protection by the government. So then he provided information that led to the arrest that broke up this drug ring. So it's August 12, 1981. There's the Arizona DEA, there's the Yuma County authorities, there's the U.S. Marshals, and Buck Dwayne Walker was the second most wanted man on the U.S. Marshals list at this time. And they got a tip linking a car to one of Buck's former girlfriends, who they followed for a week and a half. They were staking out this car, they followed it, got lost in traffic, and then they found it parked in a motel parking lot and the agents from the DEA and the Yuma County police staked it out and his cohort er emerged from one of the hotel rooms and had a scale from the car they used those scales to weigh drugs usually and went back into the room and the authority said that the scale oh here they say it's used to weigh the drugs and then his cohort came out moments later and then Buck came out and they busted him Buck was arrested without incident, and his capture ended two years of freedom since his escape from a federal prison in Washington State, where he'd been serving the 10-year sentence for the stealing of the sea wind. And the scene of the arrest was the Torchlight Motel in Yuma. They found $17,000 in cash, 200,000 doses of barbiturates, two pistols, and a machine gun. By August 25th, 1981, Buck's court-appointed attorney was trying to have $4,000, $4,000 portion of that money that had been seized returned to his client. Buck argued in court that the seizure of the $4,000 was illegal, and they made a motion to have it returned, and the U.S. District Judge ruled against him. Essentially, you gotta prove that money and the goods you have when they're seized from you like this were made legally. He could not do that. He was not entitled to that money. On September 4th, 1981, Earl Partington and Ray Findlay were the court-appointed attorneys for Buck. At this point, Buck was held without bail pending trial, the murder trial, and when he was asked what his permanent residence was, Buck replied, that's a good question. When you want to try to get out on bond, you want to establish that you're a resident and you're not likely to flee, you know what I mean? So, yeah, that's a good question. On January 1st, 1982, the federal trial for the murder of Eleanor Graham was delayed. It was postponed until April 13th to give the attorneys time to prepare. 
and they wanted also to wait for Buck to go to trial on the escape charge from Washington first. Around January 1982, the defense attorneys all went to Palmyra. I would love to have that kind of uh, research, right? That sounds lovely. But yeah, they got to go there to um, check out the lay of the lands to try to get an idea of what could have went down there on the atoll. In a win for the defendants, on March 12, 1982, the federal judge ruled that Stephanie Stearns and Buck Dwayne Walker must be tried separately for the murder of Eleanor Muff Graham. Having the murder trial severed works usually in the favor of the defendants. Stephanie Stearns, I believe her attorneys at this point were Wolf and Wineglass, and they asserted that Stephanie Stearns would be prejudiced and not get a fair trial on the mainland of Hawaii. And eventually, due to the pretrial publicity, the judge granted the change of venue to San Francisco. So the defendants got lucky. Not only did they get their trials severed, just like they had at the boat trial, they also got the trials moved to the mainland, San Francisco. Another win for the defendants. Mid-July 1982, Vincent Bugliosi, the famous prosecutor of the Manson family, had not yet agreed to represent Stephanie Stearns and needed some convincing. According to Buck's attorney that he'll later have, Partington, so this is hearsay and allegations that Partington will later have against Bugliosi. According to Buck's attorney, Bugliosi took her case in return for the rights to her story. Now, if that was true, man, that kind of puts a different spin on his zeal and his uh, see, would t- see Will Tell book and the movie rights, correct? But I don't think it's true. I think he actually got paid by her, her family. I could be wrong. And this is the part of the story where I'm going to stop and admit to personal bias. I have always adored Vincent Bugliosi's techniques, his talent, his wit, his intelligence... But having said all that, I can always step back from a hero and admit they have feet of clay. It is, I've noticed, popular in maybe like the last five years to dunk on Vincent Bugliosi. I don't know where this came from. I mean, people just adored him, adored his work, adored his books. There's almost like a conspiracy theory going around now that you know, he kind of stitched up the Manson, some of the Manson folks. It's crazy to me, like, you know, that he invented the helter-skelter concept. And and I think what strangely enough is he admits in helter-skelter that some of it was like put together, you know, to form a coherent narrative. It's really popular, I've noticed, with this generation to not like Vincent Bugliosi. It's strange, but I want to admit that I'm biased towards him. So me being critical of his work even means more in my opinion. I'm going against the grain of my normal natural feelings towards Vince when I'm critical of, you know, in this video. So now we're going to talk about the trial of Buck Dwayne Walker for the murder of Eleanor Muff Graham. And running up to the trial... We just want to talk about the fact that since they had been charged in the boat theft trial case and theft being a felony, that the concept of felony murder didn't make any sense. And so, of course, the defendants wanted any kind of talk of felony murder taken off the table. And eventually it was because you can't have double jeopardy. You can't try try somebody for the felony and then turn around in another trial and try him again using that same felony. Now, the felony of murder is different, but they had to take the theft part out of it. As this article notes, Walker was charged with both premeditated murder and felony murder. The defense attorneys argued against that and the judge agreed with Partington ordering that the felony murder charge was dropped, but the premeditated murder charge was not dropped. And this was smart because they would have automatically had a double jeopardy appeal on their hands had it not been dropped. And January, running up to the trial that starts in May, 
some new evidence came forward so the government had to disclose that turns out that it was the former convict acquaintance of walker from mcneil island federal pen who was gonna turn wit turn snitch so let's get into the trial i believe on may 29th 1985 larry briggs was one of the first witnesses and if you remember from the previous episodes larry briggs was one of the folks that was on palmyra when buck and stephanie were there and also keep in mind during the boat theft trials for both defendants many times they were successful in keeping out any illusion of murder any illusion of certain activities because it was for the boat theft and the defense had argued successfully many times that they couldn't insinuate that the defendants had murdered anyone they had just stolen the boat so now more evidence can come forward that leans more towards intent to murder larry briggs who is accepted as an expert witness in boat handling and who is licensed by the coast guard to operate charter boats said he knew buck's craft the iola from the ale Wai yacht harbor remember he was the one that recognized that old margaret you know, that old Sal, <laughs> Margaret, that had been brought up from the the waters and sat allegedly for two years in dry dock and then seemingly was fiberglassed over and, and uh, came limping onto the island or the atoll of Palmyra. So basically, under questioning, Briggs told of hep- helping to tow in the I- Iola from the reef whenever they had spent, remember whenever Buck and Jennifer, they finally got to... Palmyra and then they couldn't get in through the channel and so he described the boat as being very run down the rigging was not in good condition the engine didn't work it was weather beaten it was tired and it was leaking and Briggs said that it had taken Walker 30 days to sail to Palmyra from Honolulu but that his own tri- trip his own trip on his vessel only took four and a half days and he said it was an easy trip with the northeast trade winds the whole entire way Briggs also spoke of giving the couple provisions because, quote, because they didn't have any. And then another witness for the government was Mrs. Edwin Pollock. She testified that they were at the island for two weeks in July of 1974 when Walker and Stearns were there on their Iola. Miss Pollock talked about how over time she grew really increasingly anxious because Buck would quote row his dinghy past our boat he would be looking at our boat he would come close to the boat I would speak he wouldn't he looked very hard eyed it was very upsetting end quote and she said that this kind of interaction would happen many times like 10 times where he was quote unquote hard eyeing her she talked about how she had conversations with Muff Muff Graham and that Muff quote knew she would never leave the island alive that is terrifying and she talked about how she spoke to her husband Edwin to leave on July 16th because she was frightened of Buck Pollock said on the day they went to leave that Muff visited them and quote she urged us not to go she was crying she said she would not leave the island alive women have a sixth sense and then just want to note that there was an objection from partington about a woman's sixth sense and so that sixth sense comment was stricken from the testimony but you can't really unring a bell she also spoke about guilt feeling bad that quote if we had stayed there maybe this would have never happened Jack Wheeler also took the stand, testifying to much of the same stuff that was said at the boat trial. He also was able to testify when they did that initial search party on Palmyra to see what happened to the Grams, how they found a partially burned pile of clothing and other items on the island in November during the hunt for the Grams, and that those items also included some jewelry and eyeglasses. Witness Sharon Jordan took the stand and gave similar testimony that she had given to the at the boat trial of finding the bones on the atoll. Exhibit 24 was Muff's skull. 
and they had Sharon Jordan reenact finding the skull of Muff Graham and then finding the aluminum box that contained the rest of Muff Graham. Sharon Jordan testified, quote, imagine taking a box of bones and tipping it over and they all spilled out. This article reads, for a moment, no one spoke as the courtroom audience watched the woman move the bulky box bigger than two suitcases across the carpeted floor. She testified that the place she found him was on a rocky coral shelf about a half mile from the spot where the Grams were last seen alive in 1974. And meanwhile, Kit Graham, that's Mac's sister, sat with her husband for nearly every hour in the front row of the spectator section listening to the testimony and it was hard for her to see the bones of her sister-in-law on display and she said quote and she wore dark glasses and she said i didn't want to come but i felt i had to and her presence was felt there expert witnesses took the stand to testify as to the state of the bones and what that led them to believe happened to Muff Graham. A forensic dental expert, Dr. Oliver Harris, testified that there were blows to her jaw, several heavy blows, sideways or upward blows that were forceful enough to break her lower jaw, shear off one of her teeth, and fracture another tooth. He also testified that he found unexplained burn marks on one of the teeth and the jawbone and that he said this burning would take an intense fire over a period of time to leave such marks so the jawbone had been smashed in three places as though by a sledgehammer or a large rock there was also a hole in the side of the skull just above the temple the question is was it created by a bullet there were also strange signs that both the skull and the aluminum chest the box had been through an intense fire perhaps seemingly as the evidence would suggest in an effort to disfigure or perhaps cremate the remains which was unsuccessful dr harris testified when asked about you know whether this could be a drowning victim he said quote very seldom do you find fractured teeth in a drowning victim And he added that the massive blows to Muff's head were too great to be caused by a human fist. And he suggested, again, it was a sledgehammer or a rock. And he said, quote, I know nothing in the marine environment that could cause the injuries of this nature. The jury also heard about that last fateful call. Remember that Mac and Muff always had their twice weekly calls with Schumacher and there was some discussion when Mac was on that call that there was some kind of sounds upstairs and he thought oh you know must be a truce yeah and so it implied that the last people to see Mac and Muff were Stephanie and Buck Schumacher told the court how he was in regular contact with the Grahams and their family and their friends and that at that time, the only boats that were on Palmyra were the Iola and the Graham's yacht, the Sea Wind. And he talks about, quote, toward the end of the contact, I could hear another voice. He, a uh, Graham, said, oh, oh, there's a dinghy coming over to the boat. I guess they made a truce. And there had been testimony that Buck and Stephanie did not get along with Graham's. And so Schumacher then said, Mac put down his microphone and went topside on the sea wind to see what was happening. Graham came back to the radio, quote, 10 to 15 seconds later, and he said something about them bringing a cake over. So that was Schumacher's testimony. And then the same as the trial court that he told them that, you know, he tried to reach the Grahams on September 4th, September 11th, September 18th, and just got nothing. And then we get the snitch witness, Noel Allen Al Ingram. He took the stand for the government and said that Buck confessed to him of murdering Mac by forcing him to walk the plank. This is what he testified, among other things. He said, quote, he never did come out and say he killed the Grams. He said he offed them. Keep in mind that Noel 
was a social studies teacher that had turned to heroin and he was dealing it. And then he was in the government's witness protection program for another case. So, you know, he's not exactly got clean hands. But he says, quote, he mentioned forcing the man to walk the plank and he mentioned that the man was sniveling. And this is just horrible. And then he talks about how Buck said, quote, a statement was made about offing, knocking out of the box, blowing away. Blowing away is almost like a gun, a gunshot. And then later on, on another occasion, he said that while they were together trafficking drugs, they had another conversation about that fateful summer on Palmyra. And then when Muff's remains were discovered, and then it was hitting the news, he said that he mentioned to Buck, funny that that box should show, come up after all this time, like sarcastically. And that Buck said, quote, that's bull about the box. I didn't put her body in a box. <sighs> he didn't say what he did. I didn't put her body in a box. This part's out of order, so I do apologize. But talking about the remains of Muff Graham, some of the forensic experts had also told the court how the heat that was, the bones were subjected to in the aluminum chest when it was set afire was in the realm of uh, 1100 degrees. So there was likely an accelerant such as gasoline used. And also gasoline was available on the atoll. It was left over from when the Navy had been there. And also when they looked at Muff's skull, a whitened patch on that skull indicated it too had been subjected to that same intense heat because it had like all these irregular margins around that patch. And, I mean, you can read it here if you can read it here. It's, it's rather gruesome, but it really proved that, you know, she was uh, freshly probably deceased when that heat accelerant was applied to her. So let's talk about Buck's defense. An Australian yachtsman, we've heard from him before, Dr. Sanders. He was paid $2,000 to be an expert witness for the defense. And he did quite a bit of damage to Walker's own case. I mean, he spoke of Walker waving the gun around. He talked about how there was a great deal of tension on the atoll. And that, you know, he was waving the gun around. And that Sanders had to jump behind a palm tree. And that he thought that Buck... See, Buck was shooting mullet. But, you know, Sanders didn't know that. So he was terrified. He had to jump behind a palm tree. And he, he himself tried to tell the Grams to, quote, leave the island because I thought they would be happier. If I thought they were in danger, I would have stayed to help them. He tried to say he didn't think they were in danger, but he didn't think that they were happy there, <laughs> the two different couples. And he talked about how the hippies, Buck and Stephanie, did not get along with the establishment, the Grams. He talked about how he hated the atoll as much as Muff that there was a culture clash going on, that the Grams refused to leave, or Mac refused to leave, and that he himself was compelled to leave, and that he called it the place where vinyl rots. He talked about how Buck refused to let him take his picture. What's crazy to me is he was called as an expert witness for the defense so he could give <laughs> evidence on sand erosion. Oh my gosh. He did testify that, quote, I have no love for Buck and Stephanie, but I think there could have been some sort of accident. It's such a hostile place. Honestly, in my opinion, Palmyra did not kill Mac and Muff Graham. A human did it. The defense contended that the snitch witness, Ingham, was a liar and put on a whole bunch of witnesses to prove that he was a liar. And sorry, this part's out of order, too. The government had also put on, put into evidence a letter that Buck had written to Mac's sister. And, and the gall. That's about all I can say about it. And the reason I'm putting this towards the end after the defense's main case is because the jury later says that this is part of, like, other than <laughs> Dr. Sanders and some of Buck's other own witnesses, this, this letter really 
pushed them over the edge for their verdict. Allegedly, Walker wrote the letter when he was in a Honolulu boat yard when he was repairing, repainting, and renaming the Sea Wind. It says here, written in October 1974, I doubt that, by the way, some two months after the Grahams disappeared at Palmyra Atoll, the letter explained in intelligent, smooth language the close relationship which Walker said he and his girlfriend Stephanie Stearns developed with the Grahams and the agony they said they suffered when the Grahams died in a boating accident, quote unquote. But it also informed Mrs. Muncie of Walker's and Stearns' intention to file a salvage claim on her brother's yacht, even though they hadn't reported to authorities the circumstances behind the Graham's disappearance. The eight-page handwritten letter is a court exhibit that was not introduced at Walker's boat trial. It was discovered in the district court's files, and it was unknown if she ever got that letter. He writes, his writing is such flowery bs it just wafts okay just like his book it's just flowery baloney so if you want to like push the pause button and read some of this malarkey feel free to do so it's just ridiculous here's just a taste we love the sea wind and we want eventually to continue with her in the voyage around the world that mac and muff began we haven't yet notified anyone about the true circumstances. We feel you should be the first to know for one thing, and I plan to post this as soon as the writing's finished. Another reason is that we wish to seek legal advice. <laughs> I, I mean, it's just, you got to read it yourself. And Buck was convicted of first degree murder in two hours and 15 minutes. Two ballots, that's all it took. A juror, Robin Schaefer, spoke afterwards and said nobody had any doubt about his guilt. Some jurors said that the defendant's own witnesses badly hurt his case. Robin Schaefer said that the first vote was 11 to 1 for conviction and the single no vote was from a juror who said he could not decide how she died. But when we asked him if he was convinced that Buck did it, he was like, oh yeah, he did it. So the second vote they took was unanimous. And after reading Buck's letter to Kit, Schaefer said, quote, we read the letter after we got into the jury room and we all cracked up. There were three lies in the first page. I guess that was the most convincing thing. Mac's sister was relieved and she said, I'm pleased. My brother wrote me from the island about what was going on, the tension. There was no way you could get my brother's boat without killing him. Buck was then sentenced to a maximum life prison term for first degree murder. Of course, he appealed his conviction, but the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco upheld his conviction for killing Eleanor Muff Graham. Stay tuned for part six to find out the fate of Stephanie Stearns when she goes on trial for the murder of Eleanor Muff Graham. I hope you found this video series enlightening. I hope there, there's something I brought to the table other than, you know, the Sea Will Tell and the Sea Will Tell mini series. I hope now you're getting a more well-rounded view of these cases. And if you like this kind of stuff, hit the subscribe bell, do the youtube -y things, hit the like, and stay tuned for more. Again, if you subscribe, then you'll be notified when I upload the next part. Without further ado, have an excellent day. Bye.